This is Salty Believer Unscripted, a production of SaltyBeliever.com. Hey, welcome to Salty Believer Unscripted. I am Jared Jenkins, and with me again is Brian Catherman, as always. And uh, today we're going to talk about kind of a kind of a very spicy and important topic that sometimes I think gets swept under the rug or we don't like to think about, uh, and that is that's doubt. We're going to talk about what it means to doubt as a Christian, and and I think this is particularly pertinent for for the times we're living in because lots of the things we're facing these days, um, whether it's uh, scarcity with with our provision or loss of job or just seeing death all around us can can lead us to a place to go, is God really there? Does God really care for me? Is this Christianity thing worth a darn? And, and you know, does it ha- hold the answers for the things I'm facing? Um, you know, there's just lots of ways we can be triggered into these things. And personally, um, I'm very happy because we have a special guest today that's going to help us speak into this. He's re- writing a new book on doubt. Um, and this guest, he means a lot to me as a friend, but we have sat around our his kitchen table many times and talked about people we love that have struggled with doubt as believers for years and years and years. Um, and so my special, our special guest is Dr. Adam Groza. He's the Vice President for Enrollment and Student Services at Gateway Seminary in Ontario, California, and he's written uh, a lot on Christian philosophy and various items. But he's written this book out of a lot of personal experience and care for the church um, on doubt. And so let me just give you the title, and then we'll we'll let Dr. Groza or Adam start speaking into this thing. Can we call you Adam? We can call you Adam, right? Please call me Adam, you bet. Wait, Jared, did you call him Dr. Groza when you were staying at his house? Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't. didn't All right. Tell us about the book real quick. Sorry. So, So the book is called Faith Wins. Overcoming a Crisis of Belief, uh, and it's coming out very soon this year, uh, published by New Hope Publishers. Uh, you can pre-order that on Amazon. It's already up, and so I'd encourage you to do that. But uh, Adam, we're really glad to have you on the show and talk about this really important topic. Um, and so what what can you tell us about the book and, and even how this uh, day of crisis can breed doubt, and how do we overcome that? This can be kind of our show, so... Yeah, well, Jared, thanks for the introduction. And Brian, thank you guys for both having me on. Yeah, the book I wrote because I find it interesting that there's a misconception about faith in Christianity, um, that faith is the, that, that is the absence of any doubt. And so a lot of us are raised to believe that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. And if at any point you find yourself doubting. Wait a well, second. Must... Wait a second. Did you just quote Mandisa there? No. Don't go there. I don't know. I don't know who Mandisa is. I didn't either. And then Jared, I said that same thing, and then Jared started singing a song. What is <laughs> so, so this is a song. Are you serious? This is a song. Yeah, yeah. she says, I know that I know that I know that I know. And we've done it again. Jared. Oh, I, I just had to throw that in there. Sorry. Well, good. Well, I guess this book is not for Mandisa. Uh, but... <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us were raised in a Christian context where we were, um, we were afraid to express doubt because uh, expressing doubt would be some kind of an acknowledgement that maybe we don't really believe. And then, like a lot of people, you know, I, over the years, read the Bible and read Christian biographies and read about people like Spurgeon and Calvin and Luther that had significant regular seasons of doubt. I mean, intense doubt. And then you read... Adam, can we define that real quick? We've been saying the yeah. word a lot. Um, you're not, I mean, you're not talking about like, you're not talking about the little things like, well, I don't know about, I mean, you're talking about major issues. Like the, are we talking about like maybe even the existence of God or if God's love is true? We're talking about crisis type doubt, right? Well, yeah, we're talking about just that feeling of uncertainty that maybe you don't believe what you thought you believed. I mean, that's sort of a run of the mill kind of definition of doubt. And it might be sort of an experiential doubt a time of uncertainty born out of a life circumstance, um, or it might be an intellectual doubt born out of some kind of a question or vexing dilemma intellectually about the triunity of God or something like that. Okay, I um, detailed you though. I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to get that. No, that's good. Okay. So, you, so, so you're reading these guys. So you're reading and biographies Bible. and you're also just going through life. And, you know, you go through seasons of time where you think, you know, 
does God really love me like the Bible says he loves me? Is he for me like the Bible says he's for me? You know, there are, there are certain passages in Scripture, like in Mark 9, where the man with the, with the child who is demon-possessed comes to Jesus, and, and he prays this amazing prayer, I believe, help my unbelief. And so we know that belief and unbelief exist at the same time in the same person. That it's not that you believe and don't doubt. It's that doubt and faith are sort of battling on a daily basis within you. And to varying degrees, you know, you can have strong or weak faith. Um, And so I wanted to sort of bring to light this more biblical picture of faith as a daily battle against doubt in light of experience and intellectual questions and struggles. Wow. Wow. Jared, you look like you're going to say, so we can no, see no, each other even though it's an audio recording. And Jared's about to say something. No. I am too. Go ahead, Jared. No, no, you're good. Go. Um, so uh, are you, um, I don't know how to word the question, but I want to ask you a really personal question. Can I ask you a really personal question, Adam? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a church planter, or even just as a pastor, or even just as a human being, I've had these moments, you know, these times when I'm like, this is, God did not call me to do this. What am I doing? Or like even last night, we're going to be quarantined for how much longer? It's over. That's it. I'm checking out. I doubt that God is concerned about our church anymore. I mean, I'm not going to have a job. We're not, I mean, so that, that to me, to me feels like a normal sort of thing. But what you're talking about feels like it might have been, it been bled out of a much longer crisis kind of thing. Is that you're, you're coming out of either your experience or someone else's experience or pastoring people in longer crises. You're talking about really big. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually talking about crises that are slow burning, ongoing. Like there might be, for instance, in the example of a parent who loses a child. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you, you might spend the rest of your life battling on a daily basis for belief that God is good and loving and gracious against the backdrop of your suffering. Or you might be a college student and Sunday you were worshiping and like God was on the throne and things were good. And then Monday you roll into intro to philosophy and, you know, your philosopher launches some argument against God's existence that just destabilizes you and rocks you intellectually. You know, so let me give you an example in the Bible. Okay. You know, you have the disciples on the boat and they, there's a storm, you know, things are good. They're on the boat. There's a storm. They're freaking out. They wake up Jesus, Jesus rebukes the storm, and then he rebukes them and says, you have little faith. And so these guys, you know, they find themselves sort of unexpectedly in a crisis of faith. I think the same thing is true with Elijah. You know, Elijah's doing battle against the prophets of Baal, and then in the next instance, he's running for his life against the king's wife. And it's like, what happened? Why? How? And sometimes I think a crisis of faith, sometimes we know where it comes from. Sometimes it comes from a, an experience. Sometimes it comes from an intellectual challenge, but sometimes we can't explain why we're doubting. And those can be some of the most vexing sort of moments of doubt. When when we're struggling with doubt, we're struggling with belief in God, and somebody says, what's wrong? And you kind of don't even know how to verbalize. I'm just struggling to believe what, like, yesterday I believe. You're talking about, like, in the Psalms, how long, oh, Lord, where where, 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 are you? where are you? Or, or you know, yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, the, the main thrust of the book is this, that in Hebrews 11, there is this list of individuals who are exemplars of faith. And when you study their stories, all of them are also exemplars of doubt. And so being a hero of the faith also means that you are going to go through seasons of doubt. And so what I wanted to do is look at these individuals. How did they get into a season of faith? And there's different on-ramps. And how did they get out? And there's different off-ramps. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, we, I know we have, we have talked about this a, a fair amount in, in detail. And um, we both have had people very close to us. In fact, you know, as pastors, and I know you're an interim pastor in, in uh, California at Church in the Valley. And, and, if you're a pastor, you walk with people regularly that he have these kind of doubts. And, and I think, you know, person very close to me that I walk with, it was kind of a perfect storm of what you're saying. There was a, there was an experiential part of somebody dying that felt unjust. There was a, there was a, uh, a, a theological piece over the unbelievability of God's 
uh, of use of hell to punish people, right? And then there was right. just some experiential de- depression and malaise that kind of formed into this perfect storm that led this person into years of doubt, right? And trying to trying to get out of this. So um, I know you explore this some in your book, but how do we how do we begin to? What's the process to kind of climb out of those places, or or maybe yeah. not even climb out of them, but how do we survive them? Yeah, that's that's, that's a good way to put it. it. Yeah, I think the Bible calls it endure. Yeah, how do we endure them? How do we yeah, that's, that's a great point, and, and and I appreciate the way you sort of cautiously ask the question because the reality is that the, my thesis is that you're going to struggle with struggle with doubt and unbelief till the day you die, just like you're going to struggle with other sins until the day you die. Yeah. Do you think that's true of everybody? Like, I mean, do you think I mean, do you think most of us just don't understand that there is probably some doubt in us? Well, I think as long here, here's Brian. I think if you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with doubt. Okay, yeah. That's and so, if you, unless you believe in perfectionism, which I know none of us do, then we believe in sin. And I think sin is born in some regards, whether intentionally or unintentionally, cautious, uh, consciously or unconsciously. Sin is born out of doubt. That's and good. so, how do you climb out? Well, let me start with a great quote from Martin Lloyd Jones. And so Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures. And just so all of your readers or all of your listeners are aware, Lloyd-Jones was a 19th century Welsh Welsh theologian. He's a a pastor. He's a medical doctor, just really smart dude. And he's, he's defining faith against the backdrop of doubt. And he says, faith is a refusal to panic. Mm, and I think that this is good. this for me in, in my exploration of doubt over the years, as I've lectured on this and thought about it and pastored through it, like th- asserting your f- God given faith against the backdrop of doubt is really, I think, the key to doing battle against unbelief, mm. refusing to give in, refusing to stop going to the Bible, to stop praying, to stop worshiping. Um, you know, Martin Lloyd Jones says, faith is a refusal to panic. And he says, at the end of this quote, he says, so you take charge of yourself and pull yourself up and control yourself and you do not let go of yourself. And so Lloyd Jones believes that faith is a gift. He believes that God is sovereign, but he believes that God has given us in his providence control, self control, not only our, over our body, but over our thoughts and over what we choose to focus on. And so, for instance, let me give you one story in the Bible when John the Baptist is in prison. And John the Baptist is clearly a believer. He's an early adopter. He knows Jesus is the Messiah. He's declared that he's the son, you know, the the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet when he's in prison, hearing all this great stuff that Jesus is doing, John the Baptist sends word to Jesus and basically says, you know, hey, are you the Messiah or should we expect somebody else? And I think the subtext of John the Baptist's doubt is, is, is sort of this question, if you're the Messiah, why am I still in prison? And what Jesus does is he sends word back to John, quoting the Old Testament to John, and basically says to John, John, remember what the Bible says. And so I think that oftentimes, like in the midst of your uncertainty, really committing yourself to to belief and committing yourself to doing the things that God has called you to do to the, to the, to answer your question, Jared is probably the most like ongoingly biblical response to unbelief. So you don't feel like going to church, but you do. I don't feel like reading the Bible, but I do. I don't feel like praying, but I will. And in, and as a result of those steps of obedience, you are going to find yourself believing what just previously Maybe hours ago, we're struggling to believe. Yeah. Let's take that into right now. Um, like, I, well, I was going to say, let me let me say one thing on that real quick. Yeah, go ahead. I I like that word about not as Lloyd Jones said, they're not panicking because I think uh, I was dealing with a lady and her husband. Her husband was in our church having tons of doubts, um, and and it it her her or his wife just could not handle the fact that her husband was doubting. And this was my repeated word to her was like, look, let's not, let's not panic. And I think in our culture, we want to fix it now and we want to fix it quickly. I kept telling her, look, this is going to be a long road. It was a long road to get into this place for this particular individual. And it's going to be a long road out. And so we have to, 
uh, persevere and, and go slowly. And then my second thing is, as you were saying, is keep doing the Christian things, right? Uh, don't panic. It's going to be long. So set yourself for a long road and keep doing the Christian things and let, let God do his work. So I, I appreciate that answer, Adam. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and just for your read, just for your listeners, um, Blaise Pascal, uh, you know, famous Pascal's wager, Ponce's uh, book he wrote, philosopher, mathematician, just really brilliant Christian dude. He gave this same advice because after he argued for God's existence and that you should believe in God, he basically says, well, what if you do if you don't? I mean, you know you should, but what if you don't? Mm -hmm. And his response is, well, go to church and listen to the sermon and take communion. And his response is, in doing the things the faithful do, don't be surprised that you don't find yourself among the faithful. And I find that to be very powerful, true, biblical advice that echoes what Lloyd Jones uh, is 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 advocating for. Yeah. Well, you're not going to find you're not going to find a God speaking to you and leading you and guiding you and his people providing means of encouragement if you're pushing away from them and staying as far away as you can from that. I mean, right. that almost seems silly, yet that's what people are tempted to do. Well, I don't I'm struggle, so I'm going to push away. See you later. So, okay, so I hate saying the word uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus because it's like that's all we hear and say all the time now. Or can can you hear me when we turn the Zoom meetings on? Um, <laughs> so, like, I'm just, oh, it's just exhausting. However, one of the issues that I'm – somewhat concerned about as I pastor people is this very thing there, you know, I'm sitting at home as a pastor, I'm going to be a little vulnerable here, but, uh, and I want to check out from all sorts of things. I don't mean like I want to commit suicide, but like, I don't have any motivation to do the better things. I don't have a motivation to keep up on my diet. I don't have a motivation to exercise. I don't have motivation to do any good things. I have to force myself. And it feels like the temptation could be even greater when it comes to our spiritual journey. So what would you say to some people who might be hopefully not panicking, but really running into that doubt because they're, we're dealing with coronavirus. We're dealing with your stuck at home. You can't gather the church. Like I, it seems like if there were going to be a season ripe for this to start showing its, itself and surfacing in homes, this might be the time, um, which yeah. would be more awkward because it's not like a philosophy professor. It's not like a, some rattling crisis. It's just, we have more time to sort of, reflect on it. What do we say to people in this zone? What do we do here if we run into this? Yeah, I think that's a, first of all, I mean, a, 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 a and we can't go to church, right? I think we can't what exper- exper- yeah. All that. Yeah. I think what you're experiencing is, is, is pretty common. I also think that there are some just reality checks that come with, with crises, not crisis of faith, just crises in general. And by the way, Christians aren't the only ones that have a crisis of faith. An atheist who doesn't believe that God exists and sees a beautiful sunset and just for a moment has this sense, maybe there's something greater. You know, everybody goes through a crisis in regards to their beliefs. So just just wanted to say that. But, I, you know, the Bible says that, you know, we're to make our, you know, the, we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I think that when you go through a crisis of any kind, COVID-19 included, it reveals the cracks and the fault lines in your faith, in your character, in your family. It doesn't necessarily create those things. It just exposes those things. And so what I would say is COVID-19 is really a once in a lifetime opportunity for those of us in the faith, those of us as leaders to really do some hard looking at where, what are the areas of my life that COVID-19 is exposing areas where I'm lacking self-control areas where my character is deficient. And, you know, this idea of working at your salvation of bringing more of you under the Lordship of Christ I think COVID-19 is a golden opportunity for those of us in leadership and all of us, but in leadership in particular, to really kind of think to ourselves, all right, what, what are the areas of my life that this, this crisis is exposing where I'm more prone to do what I, you know, I'm more prone to watch something than read something, or I'm more prone to put off my work than to do my work, you know, because we tend to focus on these glamorous struggles but really, it's the mundane, everyday struggles that that make up the bulk of our character or lack thereof. Yeah. So I think COVID nineteen is 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 not the time. You know, a, a time of crisis is 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 not when you want to be building a foundation. 
Yeah. It's when you want to be sort of resting on your foundation and, and analyzing where there might be cracks. Yeah. No, that's yeah. 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 Um, so the book is, I think the book was originally going to come out in September and you're working on maybe pushing that date up. Is that what I understand, Adam? Yeah, it's, it's scheduled to come out in September. It's up on Amazon. I, I think that, you know, things are moving pretty quickly and we'd love to get it out early, but it, it's just a timely topic because as you say, you know, this, this, the COVID-19 crisis is causing a lot of people to wrestle with belief, wrestle with, you know, confidence in God. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a good time for people to sort of get into the word and see what the Bible says about faith and doubt. Right. And, and even maybe big crisis type internal struggles like you're talking about that might be playing out and exposed. I like that, that it's, it's exposing the things that are there. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, go ahead, Jared. I was going to say, I, I have one quick question for you. I don't know if you followed much on the, you know, the, the Rhett and Link deconstruction of their faith. Have you, have you looked, have you seen that at all, Adam? The, the 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 what deconstruction? Rhett, Rhett and Link, the two podcasters, and their deconstruction. No, I haven't. But I, I talk in the book about like the the phenomenon of like ex evangelical deconstruction. Yes. And, you know the 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 uh, uh, the, yeah the deconversion movement. Yeah. What would you What would you say to just the deconversion movement in general? Well, he just said you have to buy the be, book, Jared. He well, just yeah. said if you want to know yeah. about it, you've got a book written. No, you no, no. I'm like order. <laughs> it seems like this is the very thing they wrestle with, and and most of their stories are almost mirror images of one another. And it seems like there's just a few simple uh, uh, mistakes that are being made that actually get them down these paths to deconversion. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a sort of a theological back backstop to all of this. You know, I, I do believe in the perseverance of the saints, and I do believe that you know if, if they go out from us, they are not of us. Because yeah. I believe that he who began a work, good work will finish it. So, so theologically, that's where I stop. Practically speaking, as you just said, I think you tend to see some common denominators of people that are sort of prone to, you know, the edge of Christianity and prone towards, you know, like finding this balance between Christianity and sort of, you know, cultural relevance. And then eventually, you know, they just go off the edge into just full-blown cultural immersion and rejection of the faith. And so I, I tend to think that those who come out as ex-evangelical are, it's when you hear that they've gone away from the faith, you go, yeah, I kind of saw that coming about three years ago Yeah, when they yeah. bought this idea or when they rejected this or when they sang that or when they, you know, I mean, I don't, did anyone not see Derek Webb deconverting? I mean, right. yeah. I didn't think that was hard to spot. I remember, yeah. and I'll keep, uh, we're out of time, but I remember, uh, a particular popular author within Christian circles, maybe Christian circles, it's clearly not now debatable, but um, he had made one little bit of off comment and it was early in the Twitter move. And John Piper said, goodbye. So-and-so that was his tweet to, about this individual. And everyone just lost their mind about, you know, Hey, is that appropriate? Whatever. And literally like two or three years later, this particular person now is, is working with Oprah and doing all this stuff, right. you know, like, and denouncing Christianity altogether. And, right. and you go, wow, that's weird. Three years ago in one statement, uh, it was like, well, he's out of the, he's not going to be head. The, we see where this concludes three years from now. Right. But what, we're, what you're talking about in the book though, I don't want to, I don't want our listeners to leave thinking like, if I have doubt, that's me. Um, Right, not at all. If you have doubt, there there are ways you can go that draw you closer to the Lord rather than celebrating and relishing and deconstructing your faith in doubt. Right. And let me let me say this, Brian, because you just raised something very important. My book in no way is a celebration of doubt. Doubt is not a virtue. I'm not praising doubt. Jesus very clearly commands us to believe and not doubt. The Bible condemns doubt, but the Bible condemns all sin. And in this present state where we are believers yet who have yet to be made like Christ and perfected in our glorified state, we battle with unbelief. And I want to look at the reality of the battle of unbelief, how to do battle with unbelief, and the biblical strategies, those biblical off-ramps to seasons of doubt. That's, That's really great. That's really good. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. This has been really good. 
Um, really helpful. I want to encourage our readers to go find the book. Jared, give me the full title again. You have it right yeah, here. It's called Faith Wins, Overcoming a Crisis of Belief, and it's published by New Hope Publishers. It's up on Amazon. I got it pulled up right now. You can order it. Awesome. That's by Adam Groza. Uh, Adam is, uh, or Dr. Groza, I'll say it that way. Dr. Groza is a Gateway Seminary he is the VP of, your title was bigger than what I thought his job was. What Vice was his President title? of Enrollment and Student Services. Okay, the student services I wasn't aware of. Okay, so Enrollment and Student Services. Um, and also just an all-around great guy. He came out to our convention last year and, and really talked up Gateway and was really helpful in, in discussing some educational options for one of the guys that's at our church. It was really good. Uh, Adam, how do people reach you if they want to get in touch with you? Um, what's the best avenue? Is it the school website, something else? The best way to reach me is adamgroza at gs.edu. Uh, my first and last name, Adam Groza at gs, short for gatewayseminary.edu. Um, any questions, questions about the book? Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I don't have sort of a social media presence. There is a, a bio of me up on the Gateway's website, but otherwise you can just email me directly. That's great. Uh, and you're always, always more than welcome to reach out to uh, Jared and I. Jared is at Entrusted with the Gospel, and there's a communication form. We'll forward that on, or you can reach out to me at saltybeliever.com. And uh, Jared was Entrusted with the Gospel.com. I forgot that part. And then saltybeliever.com. We'll forward all that information on. Hey, Adam, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate yeah, it. You. I really thank hope you. that that book just just gets in all the right hands, all the right people, and does really well. I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. And I'd love to chat with you again, maybe after it's published. We see a little bit of the response. Maybe we're on the other side of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 stuff, and just say, okay, now that we're, we're talking more through this and I've had a chance to read the book and look at it a little bit more, I think it'd be great to, to chat about it a little more kind of on the other side of what we're dealing with. I think it'd be interesting to look backwards into this. Um, but in the meantime, I, agree. I hope people will, uh, will check out the book and maybe check out the school and enroll, or if they need student services, check out Adam for that too. Hey, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you've been journeying along in this series, thank you for listening. Until next time. Thanks for listening. For more information, please visit www.saltybeliever.com.